When I was a young man, I remember my father telling me something that has stuck with me to this day. He said, son, if you're lucky, besides your mother and I, only one or two people will ever truly love you. My father's message, or should I say warning, was not to belittle me or make me view people as bad. It was instead raw insight to the truth of interpersonal relationships as an adult. It is the role of the father and mother to prepare their sons and daughters, not for the fantasy they hold in their mind, but the reality that awaits them. The concept of love is a strange one, because our societal definition of it has been molded by fervor and fiction. This is also reinforced by the vague idea people hold that we are all equal, that life can be made fair, and that love can be fully given to all. However, it cannot. Love is discriminatory by nature. Real love is rarely something that happens at first glance. It is generally lust, or the projection of our ideal partner placed unconsciously onto the person. True love with another is cultivated through mutual suffering, accomplishments, pleasures and goals. The love for family is different from that of a lover, and distinct from the love of a pet. But it is love the same. How we express that love and to what intensity depends on the intensity of suffering and or joy shared between two people. It is easy to love your spouse when there is sexual interest, youth, freshness and easy goings. When money, illness or the erosion of time wear away at the phrase, the true materia of the relationship remains. The consistency of trust, honesty and effort is what holds it all together. If we feel we cannot be truly honest with someone or them with us, something is terribly wrong. So when I tell you, like my father told me, that only a small number of people will ever truly love you, I mean it, and I tell you because I care. This does not mean people do not care for you or everyone is out to get you. It simply means that real, deeply felt and transcendental love is very rare in this world. Most people settle. Most people lie to themselves that the relationships they have are good for them. To them, they may see no issue or make excuses for why things are the way they are. Yet it is the fear of being alone, the fear of the intense reaction or inaction that makes them hold water for their toxic companion. There is a reason the cycle of abuse is well known to psychologists. It is not only common, but nearly universal. Whether it be friends or lovers, they may hurt us beyond words, but then shower us with gifts or affection. Maybe they promise to change or they play upon our own fears. They may tell you things to hurt you, but they never tell you things that hurt to make you better. So few people are willing to do so, because we fear the person may come to resent us. Many times they will, but it is the people that can tell it to us straight when we need it that we can count on. My father is much that way, uncomfortably so. If he didn't like you, you'd be the first to know. If he liked you and cared for you, he would speak with actions and not words. Without my father's discipline, whether it be words, a paddle, a switch, or a belt, I would have surely ended up in prison somewhere. In fact, I nearly did. But once again, my father was there to save me from myself. When I was younger, I resented my father. He was everything I couldn't be. Strong and self-assured, competitive and athletic, a man of control and plans. I was wild and introverted. I cared for dreams more than the world around me. Yet as I grew older, my father's seemingly harsh lessons and strictness my entire life began to take hold as I entered adulthood. Times under great distress and danger did my father's image and words come to remind me. The core fundamentals lead me to develop my own and help me cultivate the tools I would wield against the hordes of life. The strong man made of stone was merely a man. He aged, he lost some of his fire. I aged and lost some of my immaturity. Only then did I see how much love resided in my father's actions and how much care he truly had for me. While he had his positive words of encouragement when I was younger, I tended to only remember the yelling or the punishments. But he did those things not because he wanted to, but because he had to. That's truly loving someone, being willing to be hated or disliked by someone you love to help them avoid suffering. Many times a true friend's love is shown by them leaving us when our behavior becomes overly self-destructive. When we no longer listen to reason, sometimes it is the absence of our good company that makes us realize the bad company we have alone. We may think back to our teachers or an authority figure in the past as we get older 
and see how they saw the path we were heading down when we did not. With a softened and objective gaze, we see many times that the people who abandoned us, or the authority figures that accosted us, were justified in their assumptions, as we were incapable of seeing our own behavior from a non-emotional lens. The problem today is that we live in a world of outrage and non-logical behavior. The atypical, the bizarre, the animalistic tendencies are rewarded. Everything is geared towards hyper-expression of our ego. Horoscopes, blogs, MBTI, love languages, social media accounts, and on and on they go. We think this grants us a deeper look at our natures and makes us more unique, but it is all ironically shackles in terms of personal growth. Doing something with no attention attached to it, no reward, is a sign something really means something to you. Same with relationships, my education, my personal life. Why do I need others to know? Who gives a damn what I ate today or what vacation I went on? This masturbatory behavior keeps us further engrossed in our own fantasy, putting forth what we want others to see us as, but not what we really are. We live in a time of enablers. We enable violence, hatred, mental illness, and the abuse of children because people are more interested in looking loving and tolerant than actually being of any real substance. Everyone gets a trophy. Everyone's equal and everyone's valuable. These ideas are poisons on society and spiritual development. I am not equal to a man who created inventions that bettered the lives of millions like Henry Ford or Steve Jobs. The man who steals and kills. The man on the street who prowls for sexual gratification. The dirty politician or the warmonger are not the same as someone who doesn't burden society, doesn't infringe on others' rights, and takes care of themselves. When we detach from reality by ignoring the truth of things in favor of our delusions, we create the breeding ground for misfortune. When treating everyone as equal and winners, we rip from them the circumstances to evolve as people, and thus the evolution of society. Equality sounds nice, but it is very subjective. Equality to one person is oppression to another. We should treat people based on individual assessment and how they are as people. The same goes for competition, school, or labor. We should base our judgment of someone in those fields on how they perform, not how they look or an irrelevant background. What do they generate and how well do they do it? How can I learn from a loss if I get a trophy for trying? Trying isn't good enough as a man in the real world. Winning and being successful and what success means to you is what matters. How does pretending that there isn't evil and sick people that need to be removed from society change crime rates? How does empty compassion help those who don't wish to be helped? It does not. People ignore their own evil within, and so they don't see it in others. Better yet, it is projected onto a group or movement that society deems as acceptable, an outlet for the mass rage and the internal schism of man. This is the result of what fantasy and lack of personal responsibility engenders. Look at our peers now. They are spoiled rotten. They take for granted clean water, food, ample amount of work opportunities, safe streets, free education, and so on. They weren't taught how to handle reality, and so they want to bubble wrap the world. The only way to overcome obstacles isn't to shrink them, but to grow as a person. This world lacks true love, tough love. It is obsessed with superficial causes, cares, and emotions. Love, like sex, has become monetized more than ever, a commodity as common as a cup of coffee but deeply realized within individuals as more important than any other need. The desire for strong bonds, a desire for vulnerability, for camaraderie, for family. Yet sex and love are twisted and degraded today beyond belief. This is unironically the fall of most civilized societies in history. The understanding of human psychology and anatomy are being used against us. Our desires made known everywhere we look. Our rage reminded to us every time we see a screen. We are being coddled by a governmental and corporate body that wants us to never leave the nest and face reality, but to be reliant on its teat and to never leave the nest. Or should I say web? Your social media addictions and emotional fissures are pulling you down. You are drowning and don't even see the waves. You haven't breathed in so long and don't even know it. You've forgotten reality. So I'm going to be straight with you. Because it seems more people on here wish to make money or get admiration than give people what they really desire. Which is the truth. Even if it isn't their own truth. 
They just want someone to give it to them straight and tell them what they really think. So we'll start with this. There isn't an easy road to originality. For example, there are people on this site who have taken the exact script of one or more of my videos and make sad attempts at getting a channel started as a life coach or something another. I want to be clear that I'm not a life coach, a pickup artist, or someone who has all the answers. It's unfortunate that such things are so profitable. Piggybacking on, like most things, the flaws in human psychology. Say something with enough confidence and act the part and people will believe it. Instead of these people taking what I have said and finding what makes them original or makes them feel inspired, hell, even finding a talent, they instead copyright my exact script and then wonder why nobody watches their videos. What do you have to gain? This isn't even about my content, as I could stop this tomorrow and would make no difference to me. I have written for years and not a soul read the words, and I am content doing the same tomorrow. This is about the attitude of many people. They will gladly sell their self-worth and dignity for a quick profit. Many people come out of college expecting high-level jobs, or they put out one album on SoundCloud and expect to be rich in a year. You act as though you've done anything significant, as though you're deserving of something. People are so eager to take the easy road at any chance. They suffer in the long run because they fail to see the real value in failing, in delayed gratification, and in self-exploration. You can easily spot a person's immaturity by their lack of foresight. How many people use AI to make their writings and pretend to wax philosophically? How many people copy the same sound as all these famous artists? How many people try and look like someone or another? They are living someone else's dream, passion, and vision. The hard truth is that somebody has to take out the trash, bust the tables, and work the cash register. Humble yourself, work small, and move up. I hear countless excuses for why men don't want to work now. They instead cripple themselves by spending their most energetic and youthful years behind screens and believing they can live under mom's skirt forever. You see idiots who get face tattoos and pay for their music to be on Spotify thinking one day they'll make it big. People resort to scams, pornography, and even crime, all to escape the hard reality that they aren't special, that they have to work for it, and that it doesn't always come easy. There is always a storm coming, and when it does, and it will, what worth will you have? What skills? What value? You may think you can live at home forever, or use the I'm young and dumb excuse. This might be fine in your 20s, but when someone is 35 and their life is a mess, it isn't cute anymore to people, it's a red flag. The same men I see complaining about the reality of labor and work, I also see complain about the state of women, dating, gender roles, and society. How women are shallow, how society doesn't care for us anymore, how hopeless the future seems. I do not disagree with these sometimes being true. However, what does the anger, excuses, and grudges do for us? What will it change? So what if the world is unfair, cruel, and unable to understand our pains and troubles? So what if women prefer rich men or men who are tall or who have great genetics? What does this realization grant you besides the motivation for change? I will not lie. If you are short, not well endowed, ugly, dumb, poor, and so on, women, even men on average, will not respect you as much as someone who is those things. Studies even show that tall people tend to almost always be world leaders more that attractive men and women get more job opportunities and have better outcomes in dating and reproduction. But this is also complete crap. We live in a time where we are exposed to repetitive and selective events via studies, propaganda, social media, and so on. All to convince us a certain worldview is actually the entire reality we dwell in. Look at the news. They never talk about all the people around the world getting more education, clean water, or food, showing all the charity and love around us. It is all a constant fear programming. Because like it or not, we are our own biggest enemy. We self-sabotage constantly. We feed on the negative. Somewhere deep within us we believe some evil eye is watching, and that if we get too happy it will strike us with misfortune. Many young men create this victim cycle with women. Much how someone may see racism everywhere but doesn't see how they come off to everyone else and create self-fulfilling prophecies. So a short man may actually attract many women, but since he believes being short affects his chances, and that women are shallow, he comes off as angry, insecure, and frankly a spaz. It is one thing to cry about how women are mean, 
about how work sucks and why you shouldn't have to contribute to a society that doesn't care about you, and yet you take no action. At the very least, if inaction is your decision, you could just stop complaining and accept it. But no, I see men even saying the government should supply them a wife. I'm not even going to begin to explain how weird and pathetic that is. You complain women are shallow and vain, and yet many men I see are out of shape, have no job or a low-income one, live with mom and are obsessed with cartoons and video games. Better yet, many of these men are vain and expect a woman who is a virgin, 8 out of 10 and does X, Y, and Z for them. Sounds very similar to the out of shape, worn out and immature women who demand a man who's 6 foot and up with a 6 figure salary. The sad part is, many women like that get men who are way above their sexual market value, mainly due to weak men inflating the currency of the female genitalia. It may sound silly, but really think about it. The depths many of these men will go, especially online for a crumb of female attention, is mind-boggling. You have men who are so pathetic and desperate for female intimacy or attention that they stalk, throw money, or obsess over anything with a high voice and an X chromosome. These women know they don't have to work on their looks as much or personality because they are making a living simply existing around weak men. This also reinforces bad behavior as women can be irresponsible throughout their youth and still find a weak man to settle down with and pay for their way of life. It is the weak men's fault for how women behave. If weak men didn't pay for women, at least unattractive and lazy women, to live such a life, then they would not be able to do so. There would be no financial reason to do so either. But men fail to see how many truly good women are out there. You don't attract them because those kind of women are not into guys who watch cartoons all day and sleeps in race car bed sheets. Many of the incels I have spoken to are indistinguishable from a feminist in terms of behavior and attitude. Another problem I see today is people hiding their weakness behind virtue. This is very observable in certain groups and people, yet the so-called based and red-pilled people do much the same. The most popular one I see is the perceived virtue of pacifism. I recall recently seeing a motivational quote going around from a manga called Vinland Saga, where the main character proclaims that he has no enemies. I felt disturbed, angry on some level at the amount of attention such a quote garnered. I witnessed all the people subscribing and identifying with the quote, and my anger turned to a boiling rage. I myself at one point would have been in agreement with such a statement, but I was wrong. I was a liar and I was a coward. Many hide behind pacifism as though they have reached some enlightenment or understanding after an arduous journey or study. But the fact is that they are weak, hiding behind virtue, hiding behind moral erectness. You are afraid. You are afraid of violence. You are afraid of looking stupid. You are afraid to be alone. Most of all, you are afraid to die. But many men die before their hearts ever stop. Fear, feeling scared, feeling pain does not make you weak. It makes you a human. What nobility is fighting if one felt no fear, faced no obstacle, or had no need of summoning moral prowess? I can assure you that while you convince yourself that you have no enemies or no need for violence, that others are making enemies of you, would kill you, dominate or take from you at the slightest chance to do so. While I am no fan of Peterson, the saying, lacking claws doesn't make you virtuous, it makes you weak, is a harsh truth. How can you be deserving of a woman's love, of a country's freedoms, or the arms of your brothers if you cannot protect it? How can you believe in your heart of hearts that such a world as this wants you to turn the other cheek? Everything we do, everything we possess, takes from something or someone else. There are people right now who are hungry, who are willing to do whatever it takes for their ideas to be the dominant one. And while our men become more soft, effeminate and scared, we have men from other countries coming in droves at military age, battle-hardened and stronger of will. All races and ages in this country are becoming weakened by decadence, by privileges and by lack of true adversity. You want strength? You want the woman? You want the respect? Earn it. You want to be loved? Earn it. You want a better life? Then earn it. Nobody is going to do it for you. No god, no woman, nothing will save you but yourself. Stop putting your strength out there somewhere, same to be said about your happiness. Don't lie to yourself that you're a warrior either. You likely are not, and that's okay. 
When asked if we can do calculus and we know we can't, we don't say, of course I can do calculus. I'm the best. We would say, no, I don't know how, and anyone with even a room temperature IQ wouldn't judge you for it. But ask a male if he can fight, and he will nine times out of ten tell you he can scrap. Why? Because our value as males is placed on such things. But the reality is, fighting, violence in general, is a skill. If you never learned it, it doesn't mean you are weak or less of a man, but it does mean you are unskilled in violence. Humans weren't even designed to strike a hard skull with the fragile little bones in our hands, or use our shins to kick skulls. Even if you can do such things with proficiency, you are still a mortal. I recall a story of a three-time gold medalist jiu-jitsu practitioner from Brazil who stopped an off-duty cop one night at a bar. The cop was drunk and causing problems. The cop attacked him. The jiu-jitsu practitioner stopped him, let him go and told him to get lost. As soon as the practitioner turned his back, the cop shot him dead. I don't care if you're John Jones on all the steroids in the world. Even he has his limits and so do you. Don't fall for the mental trap of being the best or strongest in combat. That is not the world we live in anymore and even if you are, someone will always surpass you. But don't live in the illusion that violence isn't a reality of life or that being defenseless or unwilling to fight makes you virtuous. It is better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Realize the reality we are in. You must fight. You must compete. You must evolve. Otherwise you will rot. You will continue to lose. And you will continue to suffer a slow death. Stop seeking the easy life, what you don't have, what you are not. Realize the days of childhood are gone. But that what lies ahead is far more joyous. You are the one who will save yourself. The hero of your story the underdog on the come up. You are the one who can make a change when nobody else dares to. But it doesn't involve protesting or getting mad online. It starts with you becoming more financially and physically able in this world, developing skills and actual influence. Find meaning for your suffering and be willing to do what it takes to be successful. Hold yourself accountable. All is mind and all is attitude. Start seeing the lessons in all things and soon you will grow. It might be hard, but I know you can do it.